I'm Crystal Keating, and this is the Johnny and Friends Ministry Podcast. We're sharing real conversations about disability, suffering, and finding hope, and exploring your questions about how to include people with special needs in your church and community. If you found this podcast encouraging, please be sure to subscribe on your favorite app and pass it on to a friend. November is National Family Caregivers Month, and this week we're continuing the conversation about caregiving with a special focus on schizophrenia. If you have a loved one with schizophrenia, you may have wondered about the way forward, or if there even is a way forward. Today, Dr. Todd Stride, a faculty member and counseling coordinator at the Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation, will be sharing a roadmap for how to live with hope and compassion in the midst of this significant and devastating affliction. Through his experience as a hospital chaplain, crisis worker, and university counselor, he's seen how God can empower both you and your loved one to persevere in faith and compassion. Hear how you can advocate for them, encourage their perseverance, and connect them to a Christian community. And after our conversation, be sure to visit johnnyandfriends.org slash podcast to download Todd Stride's article called Caring for Someone with Schizophrenia, compliments of our friends at the Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation. Today, I have the privilege of speaking with Dr. Todd Stride from the Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation as we continue to honor National Family Caregivers Month and talk about the important subject of caring for someone with schizophrenia. Welcome to the podcast, Todd. It's truly an honor to have this time with you. Well, thank you for having me, Crystal. It is a privilege for me to be here. I'm so happy that you're going to be here talking about such a tender subject for so many people. And uh, before we talk about schizophrenia, I'd love to hear about your work as a counselor, a chaplain, and you've even been a crisis worker. How long have you been coming alongside of people who are looking for help and hope in their struggles? It's been a good portion of my of my life so far. I, I don't think I would have said that it was sort of a premeditated path. I, I just found that over time, I just continually gravitated towards interpersonal type of ministry situations. And I was just attracted to being a part of the lives of those who are struggling and those who are suffering. It's a ministry of presence. There's advocacy. There's support and comfort and challenging and providing direction. So even though there's a lot of different titles, they they all feel very much the same to me. Mm. That's a great explanation. And I can certainly relate to wanting to stand in the gap for those who really want to grow in the Lord and want to find hope. So, you know, one of these areas that I think is not often talked about especially in the realm of disability, is schizophrenia. And, you know, as I've worked for Johnny and Friends for six years, hearing from at least a thousand people a month, I was very surprised to hear how many of those who appreciate Johnny really struggle with schizophrenia and or have been impacted by schizophrenia within their own family. So, Maybe we could start out by just, if you could explain schizophrenia to us, how would you describe the challenges faced by those with schizophrenia? You know, I'll, I'll try to give a, a condensed version just because there's a lot that, that goes into what exactly schizophrenia is. But if I can, I'll condense it to a few things. You know, first, it is, it's an affliction that, that pretty radically changes somebody's experience mm. with reality. And, and I like to, to talk about it in two ways. Schizophrenia adds and subtracts to a person's experience. Mm. So things like hallucinations and delusions, they, they add unwanted things to a person's experience. And some of, the, some of the negative characteristics or traits take away from a person's experience. So, for example, the adding to... Uh, hallucinations. You, you'll see people or objects that don't exist. You hear voices that aren't real, smell odors that aren't there, feel things happening to your body that, that aren't really taking place. Delusions add sort of storylines and interpretations that you don't want. Mm. Um, 
And then the subtracting piece is essentially that schizophrenia can um, it can like take away from our our faculties. For example, we, our motivation, our ability to to feel emotion, and even sort of our thinking capacities. So it can add on one of things, and it can take really these fundamental portions of who we are and and really blunt them. And so. When you take that package together, it is a radically life-altering affliction. It truly is. You know, Todd, in your experience, do you have any stories that, you know, really impacted your perspective on schizophrenia, especially as a, a newer counselor? You know, what was some of your perspective on that? And how did someone with schizophrenia kind of change that for you? Yeah, as I moved into counseling and started to to talk with individuals who have schizophrenia, the ways in which it interfered with life mm-hmm. and and really stole from their experience of life was it was overwhelming. So there are stories of men and women who who find that all of a sudden they're unable to actually trust what they're experiencing, what they're seeing what they're perceiving. And and when you can't trust yourself or you you can't actually depend on whether something is real or not in front of you or what you're thinking, it really starts to close down your life and um, and it limits what you can do in life. It limits friendships. Mm-hmm. It creates isolation. Uh, confusion, lostness, you start to ask questions about identity. Who am I? Where do I belong? How do I fit? Mm. And then for others, schizophrenia not only messed with what is real and what they're perceiving, but it just started to shut down portions of who they are, Mm. whether that's emotionally or or cognitively. And they they experience themselves very different than who they were just years before. Mm. Um, So those are they're just radically impactful stories of yes. how intense this, this suffering is. Well, it's truly life-changing. I really appreciated something, a scenario that you described in your article, Caring for Someone with Schizophrenia. You wrote about a young man named Robert. This affliction erodes his sense of fitting in and contributing. It invites endless questions about value and purpose and interferes with his perceived benefit to society and family. It compromises his areas of mastery and strength. I appreciated the way that you described that because I think there's could be a misconception of schizophrenia, like this is chosen, it's bizarre, some people are making this up, you know, they're doing it to attract attention. And that's really not the case. I mean, I think, sadly, it's easy to write someone off because they have a mental health diagnosis. And uh, you challenged this ungodly response when you wrote, you must always see the person, not the label. And I was struck by that. It was so simple and so profound. Can you talk about the idea of valuing and seeing the whole person, not just the label? Yeah, I think that's where being Christians and and believing that God tells us about how the world operates and who we are, that that puts us in a situation where we can see human beings for what they truly are. And and so scripture tells us that we are bodies and souls, Mm. that we live before him. And and scripture describes us as as image bearers, as sons and daughters, um, as beloved, his beloved. And so that starts to change how we think about who a human is, especially from our eyes or our perspective. We think about it in terms of productivity and Mm -hmm. abilities Mm -hmm. and strengths and how they offer something to society. And and scripture says something very different, that, that we have value intrinsically in and of ourselves as being made in God's image and as spiritual creatures as having a soul we have the ability to love and believe and care for and even rebel and sin so there's a robustness to how we think about people that's more than just a a physical diagnosis or a prognosis Mm -hmm. but but this robustness of 
how we relate to God and to other people as image bearers, as people with souls who can love and hate and and suffer. So it just it, it opens the door for us to think about things differently. And then I would just say that then the kingdom of God itself, the way God says we operate in relationship, it changes how we're supposed to think about people who are different than us. Mm. Paul talks about people who are different than us, and even maybe not in our our categories of productive or strong, he says they're actually indispensable mm. to us, that we we actually need people different than us and who don't look the same as us and who don't operate the same. It's a different economy than than in our flesh we think about these things. Mm. Certainly. Well, you know, you said something that made me think about even the cause of schizophrenia. I mean, there's a lot of speculation of why this is happening. You talk about being in the image of God means that you're created as a body and a soul. Truth be told, within the church, there's a lot of ideas of why schizophrenia has happened. So from your experience, have you seen maybe a common thread or likely cause that runs through the lives of those with schizophrenia? Yeah, I've, I've asked that question myself quite often and tried to pay attention to those things and and then also did a lot of reading and, and do a lot of reading on it. And, and what it continues to come down to is that there really is no common thread that we can point to that explanation is going to be elusive to us in this regard, that the safest thing that we can do here is talk about it as an affliction, because that is what it seems to be. If if there is a way in which we contribute to it in terms of sin or poor choices, it's likely going to be a minor element at that. It's mm, It's multifaceted. It's everything from things that are happening to us to the way in which we're wired to the brokenness of our bodies in this world. It's an elusive category, and I would just say that anybody who claims to know why, it's it's a dangerous place to stand on because I think it's too complex for that. Yeah. Well, what would you say to someone who says the symptoms of schizophrenia are really demon possession or oppression. Mm -hmm. And that's not all that uncommon either, as you said. And and in both, whether it's finding an explanation or giving an explanation like, let's say, demon possession or oppression, it really caters to our desire to, to make things fit and make them understandable and to find an explanation so that we can feel better about things. Or to fix it. If I know the cause, then I can fix it. Yeah, exactly. It's it really is that that desire that if we can pinpoint it, then it likely leads to a at least a, a proposed solution. But just this this category of of demon possession, scripture does not make that connection for us. And so, if we're going to go out on a limb like that, we at least want to have some scriptural precedent. And scripture doesn't do it. And then and then to add to that. If we're going to try to explain schizophrenia using oppression or possession as as the cause, then then we're also going to have to try and explain why Christians with schizophrenia don't find that they have immediate symptom relief when they're prayed for, mm. when they repent of something, or the laying on of hands. So there's an incongruence there. If we go that direction, mm-hmm. then we would also want to see this this connection between praying, repenting, laying on of hands, that, that it would it would bring about a resolution. But that that's not true. That's a great point. So although we don't know the cause of schizophrenia, um, how do we walk the line between balancing the physiological and emotional effects of this disease and the responsibility of a Christian to follow God's word? I think one of the themes that we're, we're mentioning as we talk about this is that there's a balance between this being a real problem mm-hmm. that creates limitations and deficits and, and compromises us. But at the same time, we are not only a body. We, we are a soul, and therefore, there is a part of us that schizophrenia cannot impact. 
it cannot take away the fact that we are image bearers, that we live before God, that we can love and hate, we can fear and have courage. And so there are all kinds of possibilities. So we want to hold those in tension, the fact that there are limitations because of what our body is afflicted by. But there's, there's also possibilities that a bodily affliction cannot take away. It cannot mm-hmm. diminish that we, we really are the image of God. We can love God still. We can love others. That's still possible. Faith and obedience is still possible. Mm-hmm. And we do have to have a realistic understanding that the expression and the communication of that faith and trust and obedience is going to be different from somebody who is not afflicted in this way. Mm. But it still is possible, nevertheless. So that makes me think about maybe even expectations as we walk alongside someone with this affliction. You talk about the expression is going to be different, but the possibilities for every believer are the same. And that is so hope-giving. What type of treatment, counseling, and discipleship have you found to be the most helpful for those with schizophrenia? I see kind of four four domains of care and treatment. This isn't for absolutely everybody, but for the for a vast majority of people with schizophrenia and who are afflicted in this way, medication is an important mercy for them. Mm. It uh, it assists with the symptoms, especially the the symptoms that are added on the hallucinations, mm. the delusions that they can blunt some of those. So so medication is often a helpful treatment, but not not absolutely necessary for everybody, but for the vast majority. And then I think as you sort of move down this 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 rung of intensity, then then counseling is really an important part. I, f- I feel like that is, that's going to be a necessary part of just about everybody's treatment and care. It's going to be a, a safe space, a special person that is trusted, that sort of given the opportunity to, to challenge and help redirect and express hard things and not be shocked, but to also do things like risk assessment and mm to notice whether or not there's an increase in certain symptoms that then need to be addressed and Mm. and alerted to. And then you start to move maybe this third category, and maybe there's only three. I I think I would condense it to three, that you can talk about those under the same heading of of communal care and support, whether that's family or a neighborhood or an organization, and then most prominently in, in the life of a Christian, it's the church and and the role that the church plays in that. Mm. I think every person, whether they're afflicted with schizophrenia or not, they need to be in community. They need inclusion in life and and to be a part of a belonging and a place to exercise gifts and abilities, however limited, to contribute. And this is going to happen in a family. This is going to happen in a smaller community. This is going to happen in a church. And the addition to what the church does that I think is important is it it continually puts before the person a different narrative than maybe the one that they're afflicted by or that constantly persecutes them. That the the story that God is present, that he is a constant. Um, so just the, the word of God being a part of the atmosphere and the air that they breathe will be a huge part of care and support and treatment. Mm, that's so true. You know, I appreciate you talking about the faithfulness and consistency of God. And, you know, one of the things that you said in a message that I heard in the CCEF conference in 2018 is you talked about the orienting nature of God's word. For someone with this affliction who's hearing things that no one else is hearing, smelling odors that no one else is smelling, and they're unable to trust their own perceptions, can you talk more about the power of God's word in the life of someone, any, any believer, but especially someone with schizophrenia? 
I think one way to think about what the scriptures do is that it, it orients us to reality. Our, our flesh and our, and our finite mind can only understand and see and, and know so much. And we, we get off track. Our desires, our interpretations, they can just take us in wrong directions. And so yeah. the scriptures are, are orienting. They, they bring us back to what is true and who God is and who we are and what we're called to. And then I think it, there's an added dimension of um, of dependence for somebody with schizophrenia where reality is often so unknown and chaotic mm. that that if they do believe the Word of God is a, is a constant and reliable authoritative source, there is this reference point in their world that we can point to, that they can point to and grab onto, that there's a place where there's collaboration between, let's say, me as a counselor and and a family and mm-hmm. church leaders and the person with schizophrenia, we can agree upon this constant that um, that that God is doing things and He commands certain certain things of us, mm-hmm. even when other things don't make sense. Mm-hmm. Well, that's certainly a firm foundation that all of us need to stand upon. You know, it really grieves my heart to think about those um, who have been diagnosed with schizophrenia and the isolation that they often face, even going so far as to saying, I want to end my life. I'm hearing voices that are telling me to hurt others. Um, I'm suffering. People think I'm crazy. I'm not sure what to trust. And so to hear that God's word is the sure thing, it's like we can go back to that, you know, and I just think, you know, I want to ask you just a practical question. As I've worked in the response department, we have a prayer line where people can call in. Through the years, I've talked to several people who display the symptoms of schizophrenia and, you know, how they're talking to me. Um, I had one woman call and she hears voices. Actually, as we were speaking, she would actually switch to a different voice and she would come back to her regular voice and say, that wasn't me speaking, that was someone else. And truth be told, I really didn't know what to do or say except to listen, to pray with her. In your experience, what are some practical ways to navigate a conversation where there seems to be a disconnection from reality? Like, what do we say? What do we not Mm -hmm. say? You know, this this will be a little bit different than, let's say, in counseling. In counseling, there's, you know, you have, let's say, an hour or more with a person. There's Uh this established relationship. But for everybody else, when you're just engaging on on a daily basis, in the day in and the day out, I actually think that the way you bookended the idea of what you do, there is the starting point and the ending point are right on. It is, I need to listen and pay attention to, and that is that is a way of being Christ. That is a way of giving dignity mm. and value to their experience. And then the, the the prayer part is just tapping into the fact that God himself has to be a part of this work, that we are finite and limited. And in the middle piece I would just add to is that if we have this common reference point, this agreed upon constant of God being a part of our world, it does allow us to, to leverage that at times and to maybe put into a conversation uh, something like this. I, I know you are a Christian and we believe that God is near us and he cares for us and he, and he calls us to love and encourage. Do you have any ideas of what God is saying to you at this moment? Can I give you some thoughts on how God comes near to you? Um, hmm. But I think I, I think this common ground of a constant of of God having a place in their life just opens this middle period, this this middle section of can I ask you about God and what you believe He's calling you to do in the middle of this this paranoia or this confusion or this anger or 
let me offer something to help you think about that God is, he is your keeper. He is your shepherd. So there's, there's, I think, permission mm. for us to, to engage that middle section of, of caring for somebody, listening, redirecting or interjecting just a piece or asking a, a Godward question and then praying and giving it to him. That's very helpful because I think my tendency is to want to confront the disconnection from reality. It sounds like what you're saying is that you're really coming alongside of them as a friend would and with extreme respect and compassion. That's probably a lot different than perhaps what they've experienced in other scenarios. That is the heart of Christ. That's great advice and that's doable. You know, I was just talking to a friend who has a family member with schizophrenia. And I don't believe the family member is a believer. And it's really created just a, a challenge and heartache within their family. How would you handle working and loving someone with schizophrenia who is not a believer? I think the only thing that's different is you, you will likely not have that same common ground, that, that constant reference point, but it shouldn't change the way that we reach out and love. If, if, if Jesus himself, his posture was the same towards those who believed him and those who didn't, his love was the exact same, then, then I think that's, that's sort of our example, that, that we're called to be an advocate for these individuals, we're, we're called to show steady kindness, mm. to to find ways to include them in our daily life. They, they, they don't have to always accept that, but this constant inclusion mm. is really significant. And then as we're able to try and provide some structure to move away from the ambiguity and the chaos of maybe what living in the moment looks like and helping them establish routines and and structure. Mm. But those are all ways in which we become Christ to them in that moment. We are Jesus's hands and feet. And so even if they do not believe, we can be Jesus to them. And that is, in and of itself is a, is a narrative that is radical and God can use that. Yes. You know, Todd, as we close our time together, I would just love if you could give maybe some closing encouragement for those who are listening who are afflicted with schizophrenia and realize it. Do you have any encouraging words for those who have schizophrenia and just closing words for those who are caring for a loved one with this affliction? The encouragement to those who are struggling is that there is a different interpretation than than what you are tempted to believe about yourself and about the world. That that even Paul himself says, we, we do not regard anybody according to the flesh. We are in Christ, a new creation. And, and even though there's going to be limitations and life does not look how it did or you want it to, you still are a new creation. You still are capable of and called to love and obey and participate and contribute. And it's not going to be in the ways that maybe you'd want to or you desire to, you had dreams of, but they are nevertheless significant and important to God's kingdom. It is a blessing to his community. And just that God continues to say these things to you, that you are his beloved that he has not left you. Uh, this is not punishment. This is affliction, but he will join you in that affliction and he will empower you. And maybe this last piece that as Colossians says, you, your life is hidden with him. It's not up to you to preserve your life. Your life is already hidden and there is security and there is comfort in that. And then for the caregivers, you, you live in that same narrative. There is purpose in caring and enduring and loving radically that this is the way God deals with us and you have an opportunity mm. to do the same to those in front of you. 
Well, Todd, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for giving hope for those who are afflicted with schizophrenia, for encouragement for those who are caregiving for a loved one. I so appreciate your words of wisdom for us and for the church. You're a blessing, Todd. Thanks for your time. Thanks for having me, Crystal. What a good conversation about loving and caring for someone with schizophrenia. I was personally encouraged by Dr. Stride's words and practical advice. A compassionate approach to life's deepest troubles is a hallmark of the Christian faith and really your way forward with schizophrenia. But a compassionate approach to care and treatment for some with this affliction requires wisdom and power that you and I don't have. We need God. We need people. We need wisdom. In embracing this fact, you can open the door to both information and assistance as you navigate this journey. Today, I'd love to share another helpful resource by Dr. Stride called Caring for Someone with Schizophrenia, compliments of our friends at the Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation. This practical article affirms the difficulty of loving someone whose behavior is irrational, erratic, and confusing, and is a resource that brings realistic hope, help, and even a measure of healing to those who struggle with schizophrenia. Visit johnnyandfriends.org slash podcast to download this article for free. Along with this free article, we'll also be sharing a bonus podcast episode this week featuring the testimony of a Christian woman who lives with schizophrenia. And be sure to join me again next episode as we continue the conversation on caregiving with some very practical advice from Ken and Johnny Erickson Tata. You won't want to miss this conversation. I'm your host, Crystal Keating. Thank you for listening to the Johnny and Friends Ministry Podcast.